Um, thanks very much. And I also want to um, thank Jane for many years of um, support and friendship. Uh, I think the first time I met Jane was in, at the ALS conference in 1981 uh, when I was an honours student. And um, she and David, and actually the whole intimidating gang of ANU students you know, who were there, uh, were, were quite welcoming. And uh, it was very nice. And then after that, um, Jay and David <laughs> set up the National Lexicography Project and the job at IAPSIS that I got. And, and then they also arranged the funding through you know, David's brother in law um, from the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs for the uh, IAPSIS Diction the Aboriginal Dictionaries Project that was around. So lots of things to thank Jane for, many more than that as well. Um, so I, I want to talk to you about the uh, process for creating this victory, which came out in COVID time in the middle of uh, last year. Um, and, and the way that uh, the collaborative work on the dictionary, I think, really improved uh, the way that it developed. Um, well, Lamont Lindstrom is an anthropologist who works in Vanuatu, and in a discussion of dictionary making, he observes that the inclusion of certain terms or senses of terms in a dictionary could amount to what he calls etymolarceny or semantic trespass, a dictionary redistribution of linguistic private property. So in this talk, I, pre I present the collaborative work that's gone into this dictionary and discuss the role of the speakers and myself in the um, production of the dictionary. While a dictionary, dictionary is a seemingly innocuous uh, compilation, its compiler being a harmless drudge, the work can become divisive within the speaking community, or it can be ignored for lack of relevance or the role of the work of choice, for example. One way to mitigate these dire outcomes is by development of a dictionary as a collaborative endeavor in which as many speakers of the language as possible have input into the form the dictionary will take. Collaborative language documentation has received a lot of attention recently, but collaborative lexicography hasn't had the same kind of discussion in the literature until recently. Uh, there's a recent book by Patricia Anderson on revitalization of lexicography in Tunica. Other notable exceptions in volume are making dictionaries by Florian Dylan Munro, uh, see the chapter on Rice and Saxon, which is quote, comes uh, the true involvement of the community must take place in order to uh, determine what a dictionary for community use might look like. In the same volume, Hinton and Weibel discuss the different requirements of academic and community dictionaries, arguing that the negotiation that takes place between community linguists and the resultant ideas that emerge are in fact a very positive influence on linguistic science. Uh, so this dictionary comes from Central Vanuatu, in the language that I've been working uh, with for a while. Uh, and as a result of that, there's a lot of um, corpus material um, and drafts of the dictionary going back to the earliest days. So my initial fieldwork was with older speakers, as the villagers referred me to these people who spoke a better form of the language, um, untainted as they saw it by modern influences later. And especially with the presence of Rosie Billington and Anna Krinovich in our call for their own fieldwork, a new group of speakers became involved and attended a series of workshops. To keep momentum going between the workshops, the team set up a Facebook group and that, that helped to discuss a lot of the issues. Uh, enough time has been written down since that first, this is the first publication uh, from 1864 and it's mainly or almost exclusively Bible translations. The book on the right uh, is one that I've put together um, as a result of uh, recordings, about 70 stories of um, villages. And so that's part of the corpus that I'm working with as well. I began fieldwork with Silas Alban, who's a, who's a field worker um, for Ifati for the Vanuatu Cultural Centre, and then went on to work mainly with Kulsrup and Lamar. But as I said, I, I recorded many uh, speakers in the language. The workshops that we ran uh, were like this. There were a whole lot of people that sat around, and you can see um, those in the background uh, here, and a whole lot of people who came to the workshops and were really engaged in a way that I suppose surprised me. Really. They, they took to the work um, and were um, editing uh, drafts of the dictionary. The main organizers, sorry, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> That's traditional dress, it's just been appropriate. Um, these, are the, 
We have, like, we've have held uh, five workshops in public venues in Eracore since 19, uh, 2015. And so I arranged the funds for refreshments and lunch, and the number of participants varied day by day, but there was usually a core uh, of people involved. So drafts were produced over time, um, and uh, I see going back to the, the very um, first uh, part of my fieldwork. Uh, and then this draft, uh, like the book of stories, it's um, perfect bound, produced on Amazon Create Space so that people can um, access it without having to contact me. Uh, there was a version of the dictionary that was put online as part of Katrina Malau's project. She had the funding to put three dictionaries in Vanuatu languages online and on the computer in the cultural centre. Um, and then, of course, because it's in Flex, you can output it into other formats. So there's also a, um, an app version that corresponds to this most recent version of the um, dictionary. Uh, so another of the workshop uh, participants there um, outside the um, venues. So there's always a good group of people attending. The task that they undertook was to split the um, the uh, draft and dictionary into sections, and each group would take a section and they would go through them word by word, amazingly tedious work, and correct and add and uh, you know just generally work on it. It's quite wonderful. You can see a range of ages there, so that's that was really good too. And Jack Cullen, one of the um, older people, when I had a almost final draft, I sent it to him as a PDF. He printed it out. He then wrote on it, took photos of it, sent it back to me, and that became the sort of final proof read that uh, he had done of, of the work. So there are some issues in um, lexicography of, of Nafsan that needed discussion. Um, verbs do occur as bare stems, but typically they're reflected, they've got an object marker. And so then the question is, what do you do with that? And so there's some discussion, and then we decided we would use the third singular form in brackets after the stem. So that was one of the issues. Um, the other one was uh, nouns that can be inalienably possessed. And again, we've got uh, natu, for example, for leg, and then you have endings depending on whose leg it is. And again, we put in brackets after the, uh, the stem, the third singular form of that. Uh, there are some verbs in Nafsan which alternate initials depending on realis and realis. So they have a P form, which is Realis, so creme, the G is a little nasal, and creme. And so in the dictionary, uh, we decided we would use the P form as the citation form and cross reference back from the F form. Uh, one of the other things we decided not to do is to put homonym numbers in. People didn't really get what homonym numbers were for, and they just cluttered up the page anyway, so we just didn't use them. Perhaps the most important uh, thing that took some working out is how to order um, the words. So you can order in, in you, know, you have sections within the dictionary, but within the actual ordering, then you also, you know, probably should follow this, this ordering. So um, I'll show you on the next slide what happens if you do that. Um, and what we ended up with is actually using the, right, the ordering below. So we ignored, we, we treated vowel length as a sequence of two vowels. We didn't treat them as, as, um, as a and we also didn't treat, so these are labio, um, labio ula, co-articulated stops, so numa and pa, and we treated them also as um, equivalent to their um, non-co-articulated uh, counterparts. So the issue was that if you use um, the phonetic uh, sorting, you end up, let me just do this, Right. <laughs> um, so if long vowels are treated as phonemic and sorting, then the order is as in the right column. For example, num laundry goes after all of the others. So if you look into the dictionary, it's sort of counterintuitive, I think, that you have num laundry occurring after all of these. Uh, and if, you, if you're used to doing any kind of looking up alphabetically, which probably most of the people in the group are, it's sort of a moot point, but we did talk about this a bit and in the end we decided that it was better to do it the way we've done it. And it does mean there are fewer sections in the dictionary as well because you don't have each phone as a, as a, as a So 
So one of the other um, issues for the dictionary was just finding words. So the corpus of text that I showed you, which is about 30 hours of recordings, um, had only about 30% of the words that ended up in the dictionary. So the rest of the, you know, the dictionary, the text don't actually get, you know, at that level, don't provide enough words for the dictionary. So there's a lot of elicitation, a lot of um, plant and animal names that you have to find. Um, so, I mean, that was quite interesting to me in the end that the dictionary um, needed other words. So how do you find words when you've already got a set of words? And one of the ways uh, was I got this gizmo written by um, a, a programmer and it's, it's word generates online. So what you do is you supply it with a list of consonants and vowels in the language and a sample set of words. And then it goes ahead and generates other possible words. So then you have a whole set of possible words that you can take into the village and ask people do these exist or not. Um, this is online, you can use it if you want. It's got um, Andre Shevakov who wrote it went a bit um, over the top with the number of things that you could hold. Um, and you can see you can, you can set how many words you want, how many syllables you want them to be, and there's an all kinds of stuff. But it means you, you end up with a whole lot of words to take into uh, to the village and check them. And in fact, what ended up happening, some people really took to it and they went through and made some decisions about whether or not these were words. But what also happened is that you end up with words that, that are inflected words. So even though you supply it with stems, it comes back with inflected words. So you're not actually getting in the end as many new words as you would like. You could probably control it in some way. The other way is to use uh, English prompt words. And this is sort of based on uh, Goddard's folly. You know, it's a, it's Goddard's idea of having a basic uh, dictionary of English that you take and use as prompt words, and that's what this is. And you can see that this is being filled in. So I uh, give this to someone, they take it away, they look at the English words, and they write what they consider the, um, the word to be. And that did, um, you know, return some additional words, but not a huge number. Uh, as I said, we used um, Facebook, and that was a great way of keeping in touch with people. Um, and it really changed the way that I was able to work, especially obviously during COVID. So um, asking about, um, for example, here, uh, bird names, and then uh, you know, words that I find in the various sources and stuff, and people were very responsive and, and uh, wrote back quick, quickly. So, my role initially was an outsider coming to the village, asking for their hospitality so that I could write a grammar of their language for my own purposes, basically. I produced a set of oral accounts in the language and I undertook to compile a dictionary as a form of exchange. Through the workshops, I wanted to identify what speakers of language want from a dictionary. However, I also need to make a dictionary that conforms to academic standards, to peer review, a reputable publisher, and so on. So I was negotiating between community expectations and my own needs and those of my funders. It took some time to find a publisher who would take on the dictionary, which is clearly known as a problem. Uh, and then I needed to find additional funds to buy copies to return to Ericor. Um, so Anderson in that book on Timica points out the difficulty of using an earlier dictionary, uh, of reusing dictionaries. Uh, and we, we all know this, I think, that um, if you have a dictionary that structure's fixed, so you know, this is going to be academic, even though it's got a, a lot of community input into it. But ideally, you want to produce dictionaries, for instance, children's dictionaries or other forms of dictionaries. And you also think that in you know, 20 or 30 years, somebody will need to rework it. So there's also, besides the collaboration with the community now, um, there's the collaboration with the community in the future. And so that's where archiving the material in the dictionary is important. So there are various versions of the dictionary archived in Paris. Um, and uh, yeah, so in the end, um, the work that was began as my project was taken up and recognized by people in the village. And after I had worked for some time, uh, we had this wonderful new uh, research approach taken by Rosie and Anna. So they had this other group of people in the, in the community who um, then got involved. 
and my role as the harmless judge was to get funding to run the workshops, copy edit and page design, and to maintain the database. So these are all the sort of drudge things when it comes to public versions. But in the end, um, I asked them, why did you want this dictionary? And they said, this is on Facebook. You know, uh, we want it because we speak many languages and we're forgetting the language of Ericor and the welfare of our children. And then this last one is um, the Nafsan Dictionary will be a legacy that will be there. It's a memorial back to the whole village. And it's a gift from the first people that spoke the language of South Africa. Thanks.